should we should we bother even recording this like dating premiere now that Trump's dead? <laughs> you know, I think lost its relevance. Coronavirus, <laughs> it's real. <laughs> I feel like we're in the uh, the Kim Jong Un death speculation <laughs> phase. Hello, and welcome to the twenty seventh episode of Karl Marx's eighteen premiere of Louis Napoleon reading group series. Today is Friday, the sixteenth of April, twenty twenty one, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. This is the first part of a marathon three episode session where we finally laid the 18 premiere to rest. This week I have the new patrons Harris and Robert Samuel to thank. If you like the sound of extra patron only episodes or joining in the new patrons fundamental principles of communist production and distribution reading group, why not head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollars. Your support helps me keep the episodes flowing and food on the table for my starving children. If you want to take part in the reading group but have missed the first few sessions, you can get a link over on the Patreon where you can find all the audio of the sessions we've already done. Okay, let's join the discussion. I don't know, Kyle. I think if he died, it would nearly be more interesting because I think the Republican Party was so under his his spell the base and all that like what would happen to them when this fucking god character for them just carted right before an election <laughs> like they would they were like they would just be like utter disarray but and i don't think that the republican party is just going to go back to like eisenhower republicans it's going well, to be martin this QAnon I mean, shit it's... to even a greater extent the amount of goddamn like conspiracy theories would go through the roof they'll say oh the deep state gave it to him God damn it. And they gave it to all the entourage. Like, it would be just epic. Pence is basically a dominionist, it seems like. So that's certainly not going to go back to Eisenhower Republicanism. That's that's way off the table. This is the last shot for an evangelical president, you know? So I'm sure there's a lot of evangelicals, you know, very quietly praying for the same thing that we are. (laughs) Yes. Communal prayer to pray for the death of the president. <laughs> oh, please, Lord. May may you strike him down so that your <laughs> true chosen one may ascend and give us a godly republic. If only evangelicals were that consistent. You know, most of them have, yeah. like, absolutely gone in for Trump and are... Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. like, I... As Nietzsche said, it would be better if the believers truly believed, you know? <laughs> uh, to... to to paraphrase, I think it, w- it would be better for everyone if the believers really believed. But uh, here we are. It was very funny to see like the stock market, like kind of start to crash, but then sort of like <laughs> stabilize. People be like, maybe this isn't such a bad thing. I don't really know. <laughs> yeah, the uh, stock market was like, oh no. Uh, well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> You could really feel that animal spirit, couldn't you? A prévoi question mark. Right, well, let's get to the text a wee bit here. Last week, we kind of got to a point here where we're dealing with this very interesting passage where Marx talks about what it was of the, about the peasants and you know the material conditions and that that made them into the class that they were as opposed to, say, the proletarians. And I know certainly that Kyle was like wanting to do a little bit more on this. So I made up this cool little table here that oh, uh, we haven't had enough tables a table? uh, since the TSSI series. Tom, so that's a t- I thought- this, this doesn't spell good tidings for the timing of the ending of this episode. But yes, go on. There's only three of us. There's no Derek. So we're, we're, we're OK. Yes. So <laughs> Esri's having like, what would we say, analytical Marxist orgasms yeah. when she saw this table so let's go through them one uh, by one i mean it was all right you know like it's uh there's, i mean there's, <laughs> there's only a few rows there that's Tom, not what I you mean. said offline that's not what you said. <laughs> 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 the, the table's just not wide enough for me tom i don't know what to tell you let's go through these one by one these are all the ones that marks listed off in this in that long paragraph and i i took out the core all, all the elements so let's go through these one by one first one 
They live in similar conditions without entering into manifold relations with one another. So I, I want to clarify here. When we talk about proles, are we talking about proles in 18th Premier times? Or now, are we talking, talking about proles now? We're talking about proles talking, now. At, yeah, proles now. Yeah. Okay. Like uh, peasants, peasants versus then versus proles versus now. That was the comparison. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. are we right. more like the proles or the peasants of 18 whatever? Okay. 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 So I would say to the first one, yes. This is this is a fact of proletarian life today. I wouldn't say yes. I would think it's like a mixed. I would think it's well, like maybe. Huh. Does canceling each other on Twitter count as manifold relations? Because if so, then yes. Well, no. I that, think that I is think, a very no, good is, question. Surely we have like when it says manifold. What does he mean here? Uh, the, yes many differing like no, 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 there is a descript there's a clarification of this point that marx makes so their mode of production isolates them from one another instead of bringing them into mutual intercourse the isolation is furthered by poor means of communication so twitter obviously is the you okay know, the no counterpoint. We're, yeah we're going but to get there we're that's going to get there the, you know that's a separate issue yes you're right yeah, we're, go uh, no, we're going to get there they're further down in the table we're just talking about this very yeah. first one this is about their living conditions Kyle's is trying to like disambiguate. Okay. Yeah, I, your question. I, I think what Marx means here is that it's not that the peasants. It's so it's that their their production is based on the family farm, and their production does not interface very much with other producers, right? Yeah, so like proles today do interface with lots of yes. different production. So we'd have to give a yes here. The, the, thing, the thing is that no here, I mean. when, when we were in the conversation with Derek last time, Derek was pointing out the ways in which the productive process is designed to isolate us from one another. But I I agree. I would say, I would say uh, you know, there is there's a preponderance of evidence to say no. Yeah, like I think, you know, it's maybe not as pronounced as it was, but we, it is a different relation than peasants. Yeah, okay. Like with their land, and that's their okay. main, you know, manifold relation. So we'll go through, we'll go through yeah. like... Yes, I will know, agree. Yes. Yeah, so we'll put a tilde beside them if it's maybe not as much. No, I, I'm say. all on board now with, with no. You've convinced me. Yeah, no, okay. I'm, yeah. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think a clear no is, is fine there. The real thing for me is similar conditions because, you know, if we're talking about like the internet, then we are talking about very different strata of the proletariat coming into contact with each other. But like, mm -hmm. whatever. But he, but even going to a shop or regularly working in another place, buying stuff from different things, you know, having a guy come yeah. to your house to do certain stuff, like all those relations, you know, going yeah. to your community center. Yeah. You like know, blah, urban blah. life, even some kinds of suburban life. Like not everyone yeah. is in their mom's basement, although, you know, as even even rural life, having having lived the the village life, it, it's you know everyone there wishes that they didn't enter into manifold relations with one another, but they do. <laughs> you know that ba ba the, the, right. the, the back to, back to the simple life, back to nature stuff is impossible. So yeah, I think I think the answer is a is a hard no. Uh, okay, on the roles. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Let's move on. Their mode of production isolates them instead of bringing them into mutual intercourse. So that's, so, a, that's a clear no. I would say yes. I would say yes on that one. That's no, more getting to, that I, more I getting to the... That. I would say tilde tilde yes, where tilde tilde doesn't equal I, no tilde. <laughs> okay, let me, let me say... Okay, so... What the fuck? I... I don't think I've <laughs> ever been more isolated from other people than when I'm on the job. Like if if you if you give me time off the job, I will find people to relate to, but it it's there's a lot of ways in which working life these days isolates you from other people. Like what, it, what's it, your it, job though, Kyle? What's your job? You know, we're talking about proles. We're not talking about our own particular one. Like 
personally, mine, I'm, I'm working from home doing computer uh, programming and a podcast. Yeah, yeah I, it's isolating for me. But previously, when I was programming in offices and all that, it wasn't isolating. I, I want like, to totally wasn't. And I think I, most pros, most people working aren't isolated like that. This so is a use... holistic question about the mode of production, not, you know, particular jobs. Exactly. That's what I'm yeah. trying to say. I just, okay. A holistic question about the mode of production. Yeah, like, I, I guess if you look at the entire capitalist mode of production, I would have to say yes. That it's, it isolates or, them. Sorry, no, uh, no. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I have to say no. Like, that's what this, I mean. It's like, if you're a bus driver, you're, sorry, as you speak. My, my joke about the two tildes not equaling, uh, not equaling uh, no tilde. It's just like a dialectics joke, basically. You mm. know, like, it's not not that, where okay. that doesn't mean that. Where, like, the mode of production isolates them and brings them into mutual intercourse. The similar relations in the previous criterion is a kind of atomization, is a kind of, again, unity and separation. That's why that's why I'm trying that's why I'm trying to get at is is the unity and separation. Yeah. Like what I would say here is that there are t like the mode of production it undoubtedly has brought people together into mutual intercourse versus a peasant life. That's undoubtedly that capital has. But at the moment we find within capitalist firms say the breaking up into things like outsourcing the reduction in this in the scale of any single company where people work and it's all outsourced to yeah. isolate the workers and not allow them to move on mass is definitely a thing but they would still be more together now than they would be if they were stuck on the farm it's something that i think is probably decreasing that their mode of production is isolating them more now than it did previously but it still has them more connected than peasants yeah fair not in a actual communal sense, but in the sense that Marx means here, yes. I feel mm -hmm. like I'm running roughshod over this. <laughs> I don't want to. No, 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 because I think we had the discussion last time about how the description that Marx is giving here, yeah, alone together, but uh, the description that Marx is giving here is not a reference to the sort of like village life, right? Like the actual, like, you know, like festivals and, you know, hang, like everyone knows everyone, that kind of stuff is not a reference to that. And I, I no. think in, in that regard, I think, yeah, there's a, there's a stark difference between the proletarian and the, the peasant. Um, the mode of production does bring people into mutual intercourse, but I think the next question about isolation yeah. increased by poor communications is where things are really going to get interesting. Because I think what here we're talking, Marx is probably talking about, you know, poor communication capacity. Mm -hmm. And clearly communication capacity has increased significantly. But uh, I also want to add that whenever Marx says communication, he also means transportation. Okay. That's, that's, uh, that's a solid point. So like, Communication capacity and, you know, transportation capacity is, you know, uh, co coronavirus aside with transportation capacity, right? Like if, yeah. if we could put that aside just for a moment, but and perhaps we shouldn't, but like, I think you can make this case without it. Is that like the quality of our communication is arguably distorted beyond like recognition by in part by our incredible communication capacity. And the quality of our communications is like uh, somehow mutilated by the frequency with which we can communicate with anyone all the time, which is why so many people find it hard to stay on social media and experience such relief when they go off. Yeah. The good communications we have are designed to be hellish. Like, you know, these, these platforms we can use to communicate on are basically engineered to cause angst and misery so that's that's a weird thing and a kind of loneliness that, encour that encourages yeah. you to continue yeah 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 i've added an extra line i don't know if you've noticed yeah, i saw that i saw that <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, that about that about sums up my feelings there. So, so is it so, is it the poor communications that that is isolating us now? For people not to don't know, I've, I, on the I've, on this table we have isolation increased by poor communication. That's what Mark said, and we've said, well, no, the, they're not isolated by poor communications. We added another line: isolation increased by good communications. <laughs> And yes, so it's a weird, like, I think not all of the, I think you could probably do this with a lot of these things we're going yeah. to investigate. I'm, I'm afraid like, I'm going to sound like a contrarian. You gave me the chance to have a yes, no table, Tom, and I'm going to be a, an awful dialectical contrarian about it. You know, I feel, I feel like I need to take a look in the mirror, you know, let's, let's you move on to the abyss. No, the abyss, I know. Back at you. The abyss yeah. does and does not stare back. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Wow. Do you know? Do you know the only reason I know that quote? Like, really, it's like the only thing in Nietzsche I've ever read because it was in like a Marvel comic from like the nineties. <laughs> I, like, yeah. I think it was the Infinity Gauntlet or something. <laughs> I always <laughs> remember that was quoting Nietzsche. Solid. It, it literally was. Yeah. It literally true, was. true. True. Edge Lord hours. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I bet okay. Thanos read it his entire over. It's like, yeah, man, that's me. Infinity Gauntlet, what a lot of... Uh, how does a fucking catastrophe of filmmaking like that become like the highest grossing film of all time? Fucking what? I hell. can't hear you. You heard me. <laughs> Don't tell me you like fucking Infinity Gauntlet. I, it was a lot of fun. I, I like... Uh, I watched I watched all those... Like I, I ignored them for years and I was like, oh, I love Marvel comics, but God, I, I fucking hate this this whole media craze. And then, you know, like, I don't know, like I moved back to where I grew up like for a while and was just like, was in like a rough spot. And like one of my old friends and I, we watch it every week. I'm like, ah, eh, this isn't so bad. Like Iron Man 2 is one of the worst movies I've ever seen, but I fucking loved it. Yeah. Like uh, the only good ones that are worth watching, I think, are the uh, Wolverine ones. They're actually quite fun. Nearly all the rest of them oh, are shy. Isolation okay. increased by poverty gonna go for a hard yes in both cases i'm trying to think of a, of a counter evidence for this or something that like you know some people wouldn't leave the house if it if it didn't mean going to work but like even in those cases they would still have more time to like a form connections in their off time even with people online if they didn't have to fucking go to work so yeah their area of work denies the division of labor application of science there's no diversity of development uh, variety of talent wealth of social relations i would say increasingly yes or for for the proles no there, there's division. There is, we could break this up we could break it up let's break this right. up into the different ones because that's too fucking thrown together no, okay. no, no I, I agree with that because like division of labor okay increasingly people have to like wear many hats but you know Depending like, on where think, you are, there is still like division of labor. If you work in, you know, like a, a really big division. enterprise, there's a massive yeah. division of labor. It's a massive, like the overall thing is mass division of labor. But it, it really yeah. does depend where but you are. But I, I, would, I would also say the tendency is increasingly in the opposite direction due to uh, basically like automation designed to de skill workers and isolate them but that was the case in marx's time as well they were de-skilling the workers but it, they, they were still in a division of labor they were still like operating this only could only operate trained or the operate well, this, one uh, machine. this is this is what derek was talking about last time in terms of essentially creating uh like there are cases like you're working in the McDonald's and maybe now there's one person does lots of the jobs. It's all kind of collapsed into one with all the machinery. But that's just the natural tendency mm -hmm. of capital going towards de-skilling the labor. But like mm -hmm. the division is still there. It's just a different mm -hmm. division of labor. You're I, don't think the the I, don't, I don't think the division is there in that case, but I think it is in many other cases. Yeah, that's um, like a, that's a good example of of. How they, this is they, sort of reverse McDonald's has actually homogenized the labor process. It, it, the people are 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 like really purely interchangeable. There there is no actual like meaningful division of labor there. Uh, but again, that's not representative of all of capitalism. Even with that like counter tendency, I would still say that you know 
denying the division of labor, that's clearly not on the table. Like we have a divisions of labor that in the same production process that span many countries. So even like though within those, yeah, that's a very good point. Yep. You know, within firms, you might see some divisions of labor being destroyed, but I think the overall tendency, if you were to look at like what, how people would describe what their jobs are, you know, there are more now than there was in Mark's time. There is a greater division. No, oh, yeah, I think of that's course. undeniable. No, no, I'm saying okay. relative yeah. to recent capitalism, not relative to the peasant time of Marx. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, even and I even then, I too. would, I don't know, I would be very wary of making a claim that division of labor isn't increasing. Yeah. It's decreasing. Yeah, very wary. Because you'd have to see proper stats on that to, to say something. Mm-hmm. Like that. Yeah. There's a there's a visible Sorry. counter tendency within firms, like within like particular I should say job sites, th- yeah, where one I, worker wears many hats, and that's yes. not just for the proletariat, but it's also you know for various types of of like salaried work. Yeah, like uh, I I think you're right though, Tom. When we look at the level of the mode of production, we have to concede that the division of labor is continuing to intensify. I yeah. think what maybe is going on, like maybe is worth noting is that this may not be true in the service sector for proles, yeah. which is, you know, an enormous number of people in, in, in America. So I, I think that the, that is a particular distinction worth making, even as we acknowledge that the, uh, at the mode of production level, the division of labor is absolutely increasing. Okay, next, I've divvied this up into three bits. Their area of work denies the application of science. Therefore, there's no diversity of development. Okay, so this is a tough one. There is no diversity of development. Is that in terms of productive forms? No application of science and so therefore be... no multifariousness of development. It's got to be in the productive form, so that's right? A no. It's a hard, hard yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, that's what hard I'm no. Yeah. yeah, correct. Okay, so next, no variety of talent. Hmm. I think there's lots of different variety of talent. Look at all the people you grew up with in your class who are pros, and they're all working at different... Well, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like looking at both of these like, hmm, like... I think it's you know these 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 people do not have diverse skill sets. I don't know in what world does like you know just to double back a bit like the ap- application of science come in in a lot of these bullshit jobs. Well, because- the application of science comes in the in the de-skilling of everyone <laughs> because the the science is divorced from the uh, proletarians. Well, it's a, it is so applied the, to them as a weapon. Well, right, you know? but I feel I feel like this is sort of the opposite of what Marx means. Like again, we've you know doubled back in this fucking dialectical way, where like the application of science doesn't actually lead to diversity of development. It does. But like, it, 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 it's a question of. So I think we need to draw a distinction between the previous one, application of science, diversity of development, and the second one multifariousness of talent because in the first case if you're asking is there a diversity of productive forms that are are given rise to by the use of science i think there absolutely is today but at the same time <laughs> i don't think that that leads to a diverse a multifariousness of proletarian talent in many cases because the science is divorced from the proles. Right, which is very different than what Marx was like getting at by the application of science. There is a sort of like, it's often, it's there's there's a sort of defensive reaction sometimes with Marx that Marx never had that Kautskyan narrative of the proletariat becoming more like disciplined and skilled by capitalism. But I think in these passages, you can clearly see that he believes that you know, the proletariat uh, will become more skilled and will become more scientifically literate just from uh, working in capitalism. Shouldn't that, shouldn't that be obvious for Marx's arguments against public education? Yeah. <laughs> like, like he basically argues that, that people are going to get various skills on the job that will help right. them to take over society and therefore it's better for them to, like, essentially 
learn there than to learn in schools. Yeah. So like, I, th I think as stated, I, I think I can agree with you, but for like the con <laughs> for what I know Marx is thinking, like the application of science, you know, leading to the diversity of development. I mean, and this is all stated in negatives, right? You know, like we're talking about the peasants and, you know, their area work denies the application of science, therefore. Then I guess if this is a therefore relation and it's an if then relation and the, uh, <laughs> the cons the consequent is uh, denied, mm -hmm. then the relationship is always true. <laughs> Logically speaking. <laughs> 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 oh my god that's worse than Mar marks and nature speak english now i'm sorry okay if you have an if then relation if a yeah. then b and oh, jesus that's not then, what i meant that's then, not what i meant so, and then you uh, say not a, to this question <laughs> it's like if a then b is only not true if you have a and not b okay mm. in every other relation in, in every other truth table scenario okay the relationship holds so i would say i would say yes because the if here is is denied oh my god i'm lost of course this, right. is an, so, this is an argument between aristotle and the stoics and all right you, you know you put it you put a truth you put a true false relationship at a, at a con and a therefore relationship here you want me to not whip out my uh my aristotle i don't know what to tell you tom <laughs> does capitalism does the prose is there no multifariousness of talent amongst the pros due to the application of science? I would say it's it's very limited. It's it's very but like, limited. I'm, I'm, I still have a Vulcan resentment about about this denial of logic, but whatever. <laughs> what is the talent here then? So what does he mean by talent here? Because like people's that talents. Skills. Yeah. So that there's not a range of talents. I think I think like, you see an enormous multifariousness of talent promoted by YouTube, but not, not promoted by the workplace for proles. Right. Yeah. Like if people develop their talents in spite of the deadening, like robbing souls, like soul destroying work that they do. I don't know. I think I think proles do learn talents in the job. I think it's undeniable. Like like what? Like data entry. We can always pick the, the, the worst jobs. But we're talking about the proles as a class. I, w I was a prole. I got skilled up in programming. My maid was a prole. He got trained up in in, in electrician. Like, and another okay. friend of mine is a prole. And he's like working for like the keeping the, the water pipes going in Ireland. Like, we're all mm -hmm. proles. We've all been trained up within the jobs. For sure. But I mean, is that the predominant we're not sure. position of the global proletariat uh, like this is what the, i'm getting the, the, at like like is the predominant position the most de-skilled jobs because most people i yeah. know they're pro they're like they might be a nurse or they might be an extra neighbor is a he was a crane driver or a, a, tra a train driver who's a pro he learned how to drive a train you know i mean i, I think i think when, once you have like a meaningful credential like mm -hmm. a nurse that puts you out of the realm of, you know, just the regular proletariat. And that's not to like dish on nurses, <laughs> PMC, you know, like that's not the point. It's just like, that's people get a nurse credential in part because they don't want to be paid <laughs> like proles. And I, I think that's fair, like, honestly, and you know, they should, have, you know, they should be able to have unions and bargaining and all that stuff. Like, you know, Sophie wants to be a nurse, like, my partner okay, wants to be say, a nurse. Say somebody like, with no training. Say somebody that has no training, no entry to it. Like say yeah. working in the buildings. Yeah, a massive yeah. one. Yeah. Like they do learn. They do have, yeah. you know. Yeah. Like I, I think Pop -pop. that there is like sections of it that don't that have like the most worst crappy stuff to work in. But like I think that there are others. Like you know, like remember Marx is writing at the time where like the proles had very tedious jobs as well. Like, oh, sure. But, yeah, this but is he, true. Would he have said, yeah, he would have said that they had multifariousness of talent. I would have thought. I, th I think the thing is, like, we're coming at this from the perspective of deindustrialization. And 
the sort of service sector proletarian wasteland that it engenders, right? And in that right. sense, in that particular case, I think it really doesn't lead to a multifariousness of talent. But mm-hmm. the point you're making, Tom, about just sort of like, you know, many of the jobs that are necessary for a manifold form of production to exist, creating a multifariousness of talent based on a division of labor is absolutely valid. So, you know, it's it's just that I think on an emotional level and on a level of sort of like what sticks in my mind as what is the paradigm of capitalism today, it very much is that, you know, Walmart comes out to, into town and, you know, the factories move out and it's just... It, like it just lays waste to everything and creates a monoculture of talentlessness. So I, I think that, uh, yeah, you know, probably you're right, Tom, overall. There is a counter tendency, but again, we shouldn't extrapolate that to the entirety of capitalism. Yeah, I, I guess the basic tension here, right, is that Marx is looking at the sort of, I don't know, ideal average of, you know, what proletarian relations are in the 18th century. And in 2020 here, we're witnessing the breakdown of that ideal average. Like, or, you know, we could say it's, you know, a new phase of it or something like that. I, but I it appears know, I, to be like, it, like a decline of this, of this logic and a sort of kind of disaggregation and sort of disintegration of the logic that Marx is talking about. Like, and it, and it doesn't seem to us as to be not capitalism, you know, like it seems to us to be like a distinct phase of capitalism where it reverses some of its earlier trends or something like we, that. We also need to take into account when we think about those cases, who the inhabitants of a deindustrialized town are entering into multifarious relations with, which is a greater scale of people than it has ever existed before in history. Yeah. yeah. And, and and I, I guess like, you know, yeah, being like a Walmart greeter or, you know, being stuck at Walmart and like working there, like it, it, it is going to like, you know, put you in contact with a lot of people and, you know, you might, I don't know, someone might come out of that with some like increased like social chops. The people that I know that were, have worked at Walmart, you know, came out more isolated and more bitter and more like uh, absolutely kind of socially same. frustrated. So yeah. it's, it's, it's hard for me to think in the. No, no, no I, I'm sorry. Oh. I, I was referring to the, uh, I was trying to refer to the uh, the manifold relations, not the multifarious relations. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 No, that yeah. makes sense. Hmm. Like, I think that there are like, even in Marx's time, there was that tendency too. There's a tendency of increasing the talent or the multifariousness of talent, but at the same time, also like through increase of productivity, dominant down at the same time. That increase in productivity allows new new businesses and types to come up with the a proliferation of talent and then a dumbing down. It's like that. I think that tension has always been there. Yeah. I suppose you're right, Tom, like those kids that, you know, he's talking about that are being like worked to death in the mm-hmm. factories in you know, capital volume one, like is, mm-hmm. are, are they building up a multifariousness of talent? Like, so no, I, 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 no, no, no. I, I think, I think you might be right that we're exaggerating the degree that this is new, but it also just sort of, makes Marx seem a bit more inconsistent for holding the peasantry to this standard and greatly implying that, well, the, you know, they're totally different than the proletariat. Well, like if, it, if just, just for myself, like applying this to like the, the, the say uh, Marx is writing this at the, the, the peasantry that were in Ireland that I kind of know about. I'm not so sure about the French peasantry, but they literally, the, the British were always like, you know, and their government documents writing about them, giving them out like, you know, all you needed to do in Irish soil is like just have a few potatoes. You, if you had a, like an acre, you could feel your, you could feed your family, and then you could make potato fucking vodka, pochin, and they could live the good life. You know, literally, they just grow spuds, get wasted. Man, and like they, they were given out about like their low productivity. But like the thing is, to do that in Ireland, you needed no skill. <laughs> all you needed was to be able to put a fucking spud in the ground. And they uh, get a bit of manure from like someplace, like right. it, that. There it, was, yeah. there, there was like, and that's 
that's what he's trying to get at for the like and there was talent didn't come into it you know what i mean there's no fucking talent you, you know, gotta have talent to make that vodka you know Putin, yeah <laughs> it's fucking it, have you ever had irish poutine it's no, like 90, i have not it's about 90 percent proof oh god <laughs> Uh, like so yeah 180 like so like whatever 95 percent alcohol yeah, 90 yeah, to yeah, 95 yeah. percent and you, you put it on your tongue my my yeah. father used to get it they, they make it illegally around where i am you know there's like people they oh put, they call them putching stills wow it's like moonshine kind of stuff yeah potato and, moonshine wow yeah and it's like uh you put it on your tongue and you can feel it evaporating off your tongue it's that alcoholic it's just like Oof. you drink it you want to die like you know a lot people do die from drinking it a lot i'm gonna yeah. i'm gonna put an n in there i i feel really bad i feel like you keep on going yes and then i go no and i argue and then i go no I'll put an n in the but like hey tom it's your show you know we're just panelists there we got got to get back to the broom air at some point so let's let's yeah, finish this okay. table if you, if you want to deny the laws of logical consequence it's you know it's fine with me just as long as we get back to as long as we get back to the broom air Okay, no wealth, no wealth of social relations. Uh, <sighs> I got to say on this one. Mm, <laughs> mm, so, I, 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 <laughs> so I, is this social it, or is it societal? I think when we were oh, talking shit. about this yeah. with Emmanuel, Emmanuel stressed that this translation was, yes, was yes, this, yes, 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 yes. That's so right. This is an end. Because there you do have, you know, in society, you're shopping from different people and you've got a wealth and you're not just with you to the land and giving your corn to the fucking Lord. You have uh, economic social relations with many people. Isn't that it? As opposed to societal relations. Yeah, which I, like, I guess I guess it is. A, it is a form of relation. Yeah, totally. <laughs> it's it's uh, not like a, a it's not like a deep social relation. But if we're going to. Yeah. Like what you have to do is go ahead and just put societal in brackets there. Yeah. yeah and th and yeah, then I can yeah. I think I could live with the end, you know what I mean? Yeah, like absolutely. Right, you're saying it should be societal relations. Yes, 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 yes. From from what we were saying with Emmanuel what, and yes. and this was Cosmoprolet in the uh Discord corroborated this. They both speak ger actual Germanic languages, not just English, you know, which is supposedly a Germanic <laughs> language, but I mean, come on. <laughs> um <laughs> It's it's us, Dutch, and uh, Frisian are counterfeit Germanic languages. Oh, precisely. Uh, yeah, yeah. Great. Cool. So yeah. what are we saying here? Because I'm confused now. I don't know what's going on. Societal, so Tom. <laughs> societal. It's societal. Yeah, well, what, yeah, so I'm totally confused now. So what are we saying here when it's societal? When we say societal it means, here? It means that, like, basically a relationship with society like for the peasant there isn't really society you know like society is a thing that comes into being with the capitalist mode of production as like a uh, an entity that is made up of the various productive relations you know all this all this multifariousness stuff is 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 what we're talking about Okay, so we're good to go. I'm, yeah, yeah. I, I say I say we're as it's not social relations and it's societal relations. Yeah, I could live with that. Yeah, let's move on. Yeah, <laughs> this table is a bad idea. Each yeah. family is is almost self sufficient. Acquires a means of life through exchange with nature than in course with society. So that's a hard. Yeah, one. Absolutely, absolutely no. Yeah, yeah absolutely okay. not. N nature is yeah. gone. Like yeah. what? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, families are not self-sufficient like absolutely not like yeah they are not capable of enforcing the class interests Oof. well peasants weren't in the there are rare cases where the proletariat is able there is. to there yeah. It, 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 it is not unheard of it is extremely rare but it happens well, yeah it, it don't happen like i think it is a thing that it's it's a possible it, they're capable not like that they, they are but that they're I, capable. Yeah, I mean, like it's like this is a this is not like the most Marxist point, but it's usually when there's a memory of like communal life from you know some previous mode of living that they're ab able to muster like a labor movement. But, but yeah, I like I think that you know 
capable is the word it's like there there are uh however more modern cases you could point to like yes, for example when the the air traffic controllers stopped the government shutdown in the u.s right yeah before that was reagan a, broke them yeah no, no 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 i mean i mean recently oh. like there, there there was a i forget exactly who it was who was involved in the airline in the air industry but there okay. was a there was a basically a like unionized group in oh, air wow. transportation who went on strike and that stopped the government shutdown that the Republicans wow. were doing. So, so not the, that so not the Patco strike in the eighties. This is no, a, no 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 okay, no 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 no, no, no no. So like but you know there like I can point to counter examples like the the so the airline unions in Canada tried to fight Stephen Harper and were destroyed. Like okay. they, he, he, he broke them. But in that case with the air traffic controllers, it really was, or not the air traffic controllers with the government shut down. It really was the class interest of the workers that stopped the shutdown. Uh, and and I, I think that's ex an example that yes, it's capable in some cases it, it can uh, happen. It, so workers are capable of asserting their class interests. Enforcing is what I have trouble with. Like, How is that not an enforcement? Like, yeah, like they in fucking, Ireland. they got, they kicked the politicians' asses into gear to get the state moving again. No, look, like in that case, sure, it's just the the vast minority of cases now. I guess is, is yes, I agree. I'm, I agree with that. I agree with that. So, but but I, but okay, but like, but if we're talking as written, capable of enforcing, it doesn't have to be the majority of cases. So it, there's a sense in which even though, you know, it's, it's like, it's, po it's possible <laughs> that they are capable of enforcing their class interests where yes. Marx is saying it is, you know, not possible. They're not capable of enforcing their class interests. There were peasant rebellions and things like that, but they never succeeded in the overthrowing anything. Well, okay. but <sighs> Yeah. But like, that, that's not that the, out, that's not the, the criterion we're working with here. He's he's saying, I believe the thing that he is saying, okay, he says, uh, insofar as there is merely a local interconnection among these small holding peasants and their identity and the identity of their interests forms no community, no national bond and no political organization among them, they do not constitute a class. They are therefore incapable of asserting their class interest in their own name, whether through a parliament or a convention. Well, See, this in that case, ooh, they cannot represent themselves. They must be represented. Gee, this is a rough one. Yeah, see, we, we're getting into the real hard questions of proletarian, you know, organization and capitalism. Because, like, even in China, where there is raging class struggle, the honest commentators are like, look, the proletariat has no organizations of its own. And it, it's possible that you know, the way pro the proletariat represents itself has to be much more direct and that the way Marx thought about these things is just plain wrong. But like, there's a part of me that's not willing to cede that point, but the empiricist yeah. in me when looking at history and looking at the present situation is like, well, mm, I mean, it's not the case that it's never happened in history. Right. That, like this thing has happened, like that what Marx is describing the peasants being unable to do like, okay. So the proletariat has at times done the thing that Marx says the peasants cannot. Okay. That is a true thing. Yeah. Overwhelmingly, that is not what the proletariat does. Yeah. Uh, that's definitely fair. Like if you ask me, I don't know, maybe I'm being too crude here, but like there's been how many major proletarian movements have there been? 1848, 1870, 1917. Is that it? It it's, feels like for me that our politics are still washed through with 1917 and that there hasn't been another a joining together of the proletariat as a class to act as a class since then. There's been maybe three major ones in history. I know there's been ones in other countries too, but I'm just talking like they feel we're like about the they're global more, stage. Yeah, like you're talking about like a, I mean, arguably the waves of decolonization. Even though, yeah, it, like some more so than the revolution, they feel like wrapped 1945? up in 1945. 
Like that's that that has its the end of World War One, the end of World War Two has its own dynamic. And like, yeah, because in the end of World War Two, we're talking about like colonized peoples almost exclusively asserting themselves, because most of the post-war compromises in the you know that allied powers and even some of the defeated axis powers like it's to placate exactly those populations or to excuse me to placate the the proletariat in those populations like okay, Br- let's, Brit- british socialism or the you know let's let's go through this one one by one okay so merely a local interconnection is that true of the proletariat absolutely not no right this is, this, this is the preamble to the thing that we're talking about. Okay, so yes, there's more than a local interconnection for the proletariat. The identity of their interests forms no community. I think we, we can't say that's true of the proletariat, right? Like We can't say that it forms no okay. community? Yeah, the identity yeah. of their interests, like... They form unions you know, and other things. It, it's it's clear that in many cases it has formed a community of mutual interest. Historically speaking. Yeah, historically speaking, that is true. I could defend that historically speaking. But in, in, today, in, maybe not. That does seem to be the main difference between the pre-70s and our time. Yeah. Okay, no national bond. I mean, like, there, there's definitely national bonds. In a way, like, that's the old... That's, like, seems like the, one of the most uh, durable forms of bonds, even though it's, like, often in a toxic form. Like, I'm yeah, kind of depressed. Yeah, I'm a little yeah. depressed by this. But, like, there are some people that are actually sad about Trump getting coronavirus just because he's the leader of the nation. You know, Mm -hmm. not Mm -hmm. because they like him, but they're, oh, they're, you know, I gotta, you know, I have to wipe uh, a single tear from my eye. That has nothing to do, well, does that have anything to do with the idea of America as a workers' nation? (laughs) No, I, I, unless, you know, unless Trump is standing up for the workers against all the moochers. I I, I feel like that's just going into weird fucking, like, (laughs) hard right socialism bullshit so i, well, I don't like, know i mean it is but that's the Repub- that's a republican party's rhetoric and that's like yeah 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 that, there's like i don't know that's the form of workers identity that's mostly alive in the united states and the, right. the way that that ties in and builds up to the nation like that's the thing i'm having trouble with right is that- and it, it is a thing that politicians consistently play to the idea of national workers' interests, like yeah. even if they, even if they don't legislate in favor of it, they do have to pay at least lip service to the idea, right? Especially with the whole essential workers thing, that was one of the most interesting moments because the essential proletariat is like a, I don't know, it's like a conversation I had about some like the nihilist communist pamphlet, you know what I mean, by Monsieur Dupont, who like just excoriates the whole Marxist tradition and, but like still, still thinks there's a, an essential proletariat that keeps shit running that if they mm-hmm. strike, you know, it's, it's all over. Like, I know it's not the exact same thing with the whole concept of an essential worker popping up in the national discourse kind of yeah. like, flipped my wig because of that. <laughs> I was like, was what? The- what is DuPont in the air? What is this? And, there you know, was, not a, DuPont, there was a, a, a very brief moment where those people were considered to be valuable in a, in a very, very, very short moment in time. And then they went back to paying them nothing. There was some, you know, like Soviet style celebrations of the, of the essential workers for a while. Yeah. 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 I, that was very charming. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So national bond, we could say it exists. No political organization among them. Unless you count the labor party. Yeah, it's like there are there are political organizations that co-opt them, and that is more than you could ever say for the peasantry, right? Depends. There was like in Ireland in the Iran Marxist time, there definitely was peasant organizations. There was land reform, movement, and there was stuff like that. So, uh, you know, I'm wondering how strong 
these ones are. And the peasants definitely had a national had a national bond. I, I, it, it, through Bonaparte, yeah, through Bonaparte, they did. So I, I, yeah. I, I'm skeptical of Marx's description of those two. Yeah, and and I mean, how do you talk about the USSR without talking about the class interests of the peasantry? Like, well, that's in, what in the I way meant. That that's political or politically organized. You know what I mean? Like, mm. even like the defenders of you know the USSR. Yeah, I like, mean, it's it's fair to say, like, you know, the the SRs were not peasants, but they definitely represented a kind of peasant class interest. Yeah. And like the Bolsheviks weren't of the proletariat and nor yeah. were the Mensheviks. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's kind yeah. of what I meant as well by saying that the 1945 kind of revolutions were like the 1917 one, because they were mostly peasant. You know what I mean? That's why I kind of feel like that they're kind of similar. I don't know if that's, I, I can kind of uh, see that. You know, like, like it wasn't a, a new yeah. model of organization. It was a kind of a similar Leninist, Stalinist kind of organization for a lot of them. It depends on the country. But, you know, yeah, there there is a, I, I don't know, there's a like peasant class interest dynamic that is playing into the, you know, casting off some of the imperial world system. I don't think it's fair to say that's an extension of Russia because Russia was an empire. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and we're talking about, countries casting off imperial chains it is true it is true i yeah i'm kind of dumbing it down but i i don't yeah i just don't feel like there's been a huge like i don't feel like the 1940s stuff like i've said chinese getting the british out or whatever i don't feel like that was a a new and it didn't feel like a new model it doesn't feel like a new model to me of organ of proletarian organization I mean, China, China. China seems to be the obvious like case where there's a Leninist application, and it's there's still like an explicit block of four classes and that sort of thing. I think we're gonna have to agree to disagree here. Like, I forty five has its own. Forty five is a specific set of the proletariat having its own like revolutionary wave, and arguably, you know, these are bourgeois revolutions. But arguably, what actually ends up happening with nineteen seventeen is a prolonged, painful transition to capitalism so like i don't know what i'm talking about but like i was really i was kind of thinking mainly mainly china in my in my head like how many of the 45 revolutions i suppose are we were were kind of marxist are we socialists are we talking about like the eastern bloc is that what you mean those ones uh, and oh no no in the outside of like what yugoslavia um none of those countries were set up by revolutions that's what um, i'm thinking like so no, where, i'm like, talking about decolonization Okay, yeah, yeah like, not really, break, break up really the British Empire. Like, yeah, but I don't even think of them as how many of them were actually explicitly socialist. I, I'm I'm just saying that there was a wave of revolutions. Like, I think that whether one of them is a bourgeois revolution with red flags, and whether one of them is you know a more honest bourgeois revolution, like is kind of immaterial. The the proletariat were behind not having the imperialists there anymore in both okay. cases. Yeah, mm -hmm. fair enough. Okay. Yep. So I don't know. This, this is big and messy. We've been doing this for an hour. I mean, like, but it's it's kind of a question. Like, yeah, like, does Marx have a fair political read of the peasants? Like, it seems like he kind of oversimplifies peasant dynamics in order to make the proletariat very distinct. Being taken advantage of doesn't count as political representation for Marx because otherwise, you know, Bonaparte would be expressing, you know, their class interests in a way that he's granting to the proletariat. The whole point of Marx is that the proletariat are supposed to represent themselves, and we're in a situation where that seems compromised, and it seems like they can only be taken advantage of. So it's like Marx's framework isn't really working out for us at the moment, you know, if we're right, just right. dissecting it into these like yeah. logical binary statements. I, I think that the, the key thing that Marx is getting at here is they are incapable of asserting their class interest in their own name, whether through a parliament or a convention. They cannot represent themselves. They must be represented. The representative must at the same time appear as their master as an authority over them, an unlimited governmental power which protects them from the other classes and sends them rain and sunshine from above. Now, I would definitely say there have been periods in the history of the proletariat 
where this kind of relationship has held, right? Like right. FDR, right. FDR was kind of this for the workers, right? Definitely, yeah. Although not really in the name of the worker, like and no, no. Uh, what I mean is appear yeah. as their master, as an authority over them, an unlimited governmental power which protects them from the other classes and sends them rain and sh- sunshine from above. It's not the same way that Stalin considered himself to be. Like, no, 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 no. Was no. regarded as, you know what I mean? I, but I, I, I do yeah. know what you mean. Like FDR was doing this so that there wouldn't be a Stalin. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, but, and I, I think but, it's yeah, also the case, functionally. like, when we look at the case of Stalin, it's like, well, the proletariat in the USSR was pretty much already dead and spent at that time. When when you sure. when you look at FDR, that's absolutely not the case in America, you know? Right. That's absolutely not the case. And, you know, FDR was like a big co-option. And of, it's of that, that kind of like FDR slash Perón kind of uh, dynamic that I think it bears some similarity to the way that Marx describes the relationship of the peasantry to Bonaparte. I think, I think what we come away with is like, yeah, this distinction is not as binary as we might initially think or as Marx portrays it here. Yeah, yeah I, I think I think it's certainly like in Marx's time, the proles like at varying different times acted as a class. They really did. And in our lifetimes, the proles haven't acted as a class. I, I can't it's think very of very rare. That. It happens, but it's very, very rare. You know, maybe you could say uh, Chavismo, maybe, or Morales know, or man. something like that. I'm not going to say, I'm not putting them up as a, as a, a socialist wonderland or something, but there's definitely something like, like compared to what's happened in Europe, there's been nothing. Like in Europe, in my time, like uh, if you, I suppose, Jacques, um, the last one was probably in France, was it? With um, Mitterrand? Was that the last time the pros <sighs> kind of did anything? I mean, I, I guess, but I think I think you're really underselling in all of those cases, the level they, that, you know, like it's not really just, you know, pure pro class interest there. That is like highly mediated. And uh, I, and I agree. I agree. And, and it, 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 I also say, I also would say, Tom, that like, the proles still assert their class interest, qua their class interest in France all the fucking time because they have these these strong legacy organizations. Like you know, they just get out in the street and start burning shit. Like as proles, yeah. like on the regular uh, to defend their class interest. Like that that is a thing that has not died in France. Unionization is pretty low in France. But the militant vanguard of the proletariat there is still quite effective politically. Yeah, and although I wouldn't quite put it at like French levels here, you know, far be it for me to uh, give compliments to the French. You know, like we we do have militant proletarian self representation in the United States. It's just you know it seems like the end of the world when the proletariat stands up to police murder, and you know it people try to co opt it really hard, but. You know, we have had a movement this whole year. Like, mm-hmm. th- it's been going on for a long time. And I, I kept sort of thinking, oh, this is it. This has got to be the end of it. But no, it just keeps fucking going. So, you know, it is possible for the proletariat to assert their class interest in a way that is clearly an attack on the executive state, sometimes an attack on the political state. But it is not the kind of representation that Marx is talking about here. It's not mm-hmm. like, you know, permanent political organization. It's cer- certainly, in, certainly what's happening now, you know, there's, there's nothing like that at the moment. Is there anywhere? Like, d- just because they're acting as a class, they don't have like a, they're not organized together as a, an, an, as a political union operating, representing themselves towards a goal. You know, a lot of it is sporadic, just fuck shit up on the streets to prevent them cutting taking our stuff it's not a you know yeah. it's, it's not tr- really it's not it's it's the bare minimum of representing yourself it class, bears what I would say. it bears more similarity to a peasant revolt than it does to a a sustained 
organization with a view towards a parliament or, or a convention. Correct. I, I think uh, personally, in, in Europe, has there been much done in a hundred years? Not, not too much. Nothing since World War Two, you would think. Is that fair? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, you know, the, the period shortly thereafter. You know, May yeah. sixty-eight. Like, h- however, you know, not like earth-shattering as it seems now. There was more, you know, organization and more like radicalism that had an eye towards state power then. We don't have to glorify May 68 to say that it's like, you know, <laughs> it's more of a challenge than is usually offered now in Europe. You know, and it is still the case that there are workers' parties all over the place in Europe. But how much do they actually represent the proletariat? Or how much are they a sort of independent power that brokers with the proletariat? That's, that is a, that is a, that is a, that is a question, you know. Right. Sorry for inflicting that on all of you. Well, yeah, I, 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 I think, I think it, was it was valuable because yeah. it's like, you know, these things are actually more confused than Marx puts them out to be. And I think, you know, that kind of uh, raises questions about how accurate McNair's read is of, of history. Yeah, meaning? Me, well, because McNair draws this hard line between what peasants can achieve politically on the basis of what Marx says here versus what the proletariat can achieve politically. And the reason why 20th century communism failed is because it was built on a peasant basis, which Marx states here cannot achieve the kind of democracy that we are aiming for, which the proletariat can. Yeah. And uh, like following Lars Lee, like Lars Lee explains the civil war as creating a food supply dictatorship in essentially the peasantry's like class interests and for all of Lars Lee's interest in, you know, the Zimmerwald Leninists and, you know, the connecting the Bolsheviks to the social democratic, like Kautskyan tradition, that whole sort of so-called neo Kautskyist read between Lee and McNair of Lenin and the Bolsheviks really breaks down during the civil war and they blame all of that on peasants and peasant class interests. And it seems like the answer must be much more complicated than that. And this is often like a Trotskyist talking point that has like a pretty good Marxian pedigree, but maybe it's just a bunch of bullshit. But is the point not more so that the reason why they had to, like, they ended... Sorry, I don't know if I'm misinterpreting, but, like, it seems to me McNair's kind of, like, the key thing he says is that you needed to be... uh, You needed it to be continental level. That... Mm. um, No, I don't don't think that's the key point in explaining the failure of 20th century worker peasant alliance revolutionary communism i i i don't think that's the key point well uh, sorry but the you, point you can, being we can maybe like talk about the overall trajectory towards communism that way but you can't explain the breakdown of internal democracy that way but is it not that the material conditions they didn't have they hadn't developed so you got to get your surplus somewhere to get your to spend your money on your your increase in your productivity so who who can you possibly exploit? And it has to be the the peasants. And yes, once you go down the, that route, you're basically going into like a hyper capitalist one, and you can only do that at the bar of the gun. But I I also think like Mc, McNair's argument does crucially r- rely on this idea that the peasants are incapable of asserting their class interests in their own name, whether through a parliament or a convention, they cannot represent themselves. They must be represented. The representative must at the same time appear as their master as an authority over them, an unlimited governmental power, which protects them from the air classes and sends them bringing sunshine from above. Like this is like essentially McNair from what I remember says, well, the workers were kind of defeated in the Bolshevik revolution and in order for the, the Bolsheviks to attain power, they had to assume this master form in order to have a successful political relationship with the peasantry. 
which ultimately led to Stalin. Right. Which, if you want to explain the the entire Soviet Union in terms of peasant class interests, it's like explaining the entire Soviet Union in terms of aristocratic class interests. Like, <laughs> we're talking about the liquidation of that class as being an expression of the class interest. Right. <laughs> but, but, like, did Stalin... Yeah, Stalin not... He hardly protected the peasant interests class. Yeah, it, it would be he pretty hard them. to say that. It, yeah, yeah, like... like that's uh, Trotsky's um, critique of Stalin as doing zigzags, you know, of leaning mm-hmm. into the peasant class interests on at one time, you know, borrowing from the right and then borrowing from the so- so-called left and d- doing an incredibly insane rapid force collectivization that essentially is like, I don't know, you know, you could call it not a democide, but by the time you're dizzy with success and you're, you a know, you've reached a hundred, uh, yeah, you've reached a hundred percent collectivization. And, you know, the loading bar is complete. There's a lot of blood spilled. Yeah, so I think it's... You're probably right, Tom, that... Oof, there's, a kind of, there's a kind of slippage between the argument that Marx makes here and McNair's argument about... Which is, you know, a pretty common argument about the USSR, about the need to proletarianize with dictatorial force, right? The relationship to the peasantry was dictatorial, but not really as a benevolent master except in rhetoric, right? It was actually a dictatorship for the Bolsheviks that, I mean, even then that's hard to state, right? Like with Stalin, it's hard to say that the interest here was the Bolshevik interest. It, yeah, it's, for the same reason, because he liquidates yeah, it's the Bolsheviks. It, yeah, it's it's more like... He just basically did, he did that kind of thing that Marx talks about, like uh, Bonaparte having to like assuage his class and then assuage that class and assuage his class. Except what Stalin did is like, he just massacred that class, massacred this class, <laughs> massacred that class. yeah. Yeah, yeah. With, with maintaining the sort of rhetoric that Marx identifies as the Bonapartist master over the peasantry. It's weird. It's um, profoundly weird. And maybe yeah. this is why it's so hard to use the Bonapartist category well. There's a lot packed in here that, like, describes an interest. It describes a phenomenon, and, you know, it points to, like, a kind of relation that go- kind of spins out of control that you can see is one of the manifold ways that capitalist political life can develop. Even, you know, when situated in, you know, peasant class interest, like it often does not pan out this way. And I guess Marx is pointing to Bonaparte, like actually destroying the peasantry in the name of the peasantry. So there is that. Yes, yes, yes. Like, I think that that McNair's argument about the need for forced proletarianization as a way out of the Bolshevik dilemma still holds, right? That idea of, like, okay, you don't have a developed economy, you don't have a politically developed proletariat, and the mass of people are peasants— and you are in a situation of immense political danger, there is a a logic that flows out of that to doing the Stalinist forced proletarianization through mass violence, right? Like, that still makes sense. If you are are Stalin and you are trying to act out of self-preservation, like, that still makes sense as a strategy. Yeah. I, I, like the like the logic flows. It's, it's, it's a pretty ugly logic. Let's oh yeah, say, no, um, like yeah, it's yeah, very yeah. cynical. Yeah, no, but... it's totally cynical, and I don't know. There is something to that, but I, I guess the real question is, on like the proletarian side of this equation, did the proletariat end up in the twentieth century better able to do you know political organization in a way that it doesn't end up in it similarly? I guess. And I don't know. I, I can't give an unequivocal answer to the degree I'd, I'd like to. 
I feel like there's so much stuff that flows into the ability of the proletariat to self-govern. It actually has to do with, like, educational resources and not really what happens on the job site. Like, yeah, like when we see the proletariat today as being able to self-govern, like when we envision that possible future, a lot of it has to do with like, yeah, there's like tons of multifariousness of talent that is fostered by the education system, which is like, you know, real. And there is like a kind of potential energy there, which we could all see. It's just, it doesn't really come out of the work site. Yeah, then it's ground to fucking dust on the job market, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's so much to chew on and think about here. Like, it's hard for me to summarize everything that we've kind of touched on with regards to these class relations. I'm glad we're going to be reading a book about class after this. Tom, you need to save this table for that discussion. Oh, um, yeah. Well, like, I, honestly, I think there needs to be a few. The table needs to be a bit bigger. It needs like a, a peasants then, a peasants now, a proles now, and a proles then, and then it hey, needs you like. Know, there, there, are, there are a lot of there are a lot of leftist academics who are who are one hundred percent tied to the cause of peasants now. So this is true. Know. Yeah, and we we also need then like you know like a decreasing tendency or increasing tendency as well. So if we have if we can put on our uh, eleven dimensional glasses. We should be fine. We'll sort it out. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. The artwork for the show was created by the Korean artist and author of the 2019 Marx Engels illustration book. You can check out links to his work and Twitter account in the show notes. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollars.